episode of the Onco PT podcast. We have a podcast favorite on today. I'm so thrilled to welcome back Lisa Silvestri of Oasis Physical Therapy and Wellness. If you've listened to some of the really early episodes of the Onco PT podcast, you know that I interviewed Lisa shortly after she first started her practice. And fast forward now, it is 2023. And Lisa has now had her private oncology practice for three years. And so she is on to talk all about the insider scoop, the behind the scenes of running a private practice oncology clinic. So Lisa, welcome back to the Onco PT podcast. Hi, and thank you so much for having me back. I'm thrilled to be here. So Lisa and I, I, it's very rare that I actually meet people in person, Lisa, when it comes to like podcast world, because everything is just so online these days, still is. But we finally met, I think for the first time, in Boston in 2021. Is that correct? I think it was Vegas. Wasn't it Power in Vegas, right? <gasps> it As was Vegas. Down? Oh, my God. I, can you tell I have blocked that out of my mind because of how traumatic it was? That's right, because I remember, so we met. And we sat at a table together for like the last few sessions of the conference. And you actually left the conference early because California was like shutting down. Is that right? Yes. California was shutting down. I was afraid I was going to get stuck in Vegas, which, you know, sometimes isn't a bad thing, but that weekend it was. And um, yeah, that was the last flight I took for a very long time. Oh my God. The last time we saw each other face to face. So it's kind of fun right now that everyone's starting to meet face to face again. Oh my God. I can't, I, again, like literally how traumatic my brain was that I was like, I haven't met Lisa until Boston. Okay. So we met in Vegas and then we got to see each other again in Boston, which was wonderful. Yes. So tell yes. us about your private practice. Where are you located? What do you do? All the things. So Oasis Physical Therapy and Wellness is my, uh, my other baby, and we are located in San Ramon, California, which is the East Bay, uh, San Francisco, greater San Francisco area, I guess I should say. Okay. So we are closer to the Oakland, Berkeley area. And, you know, it's been a wild ride these past few years. So when we first met at Power, I was mm -hmm. just sort of starting my mobile business leaving my prior hospital environment. And then fast forward, uh, it was going well. So I got a small office mm -hmm. and um, now April will be Oasis's third birthday, third anniversary. And my practice continues to grow by leaps and bounds, sometimes just the way I hoped and sometimes not, but it is um, really exciting to watch how things grow some in a very natural manner and some things that I'm trying to force a little bit more, but just because I really think that the community will benefit from it. Yeah. You and I kind of had some of these beginning conversations off air before we push record, but let's jump right into it. What are some of the things that for you have been growing really naturally lately in your private practice? I think, you know, patient care is always what comes natural to us as clinicians. And mm -hmm. um, before we started meeting in person again, I spent a lot of time doing CEUs online and now going back to conferences. And um, for me, the continuum of care that I'm trying to achieve in my practice is starting to become a little bit more natural. As we all know in, you know, private practice, it's still hard to get the patients in for a prehab visit, mm -hmm. but in private practice, we do have that ability to sell our long-term care vision. And mm -hmm. for me, that is, I want to see you throughout the continuum of your treatment. And should you need me, we can continue with maintenance. We can mm -hmm. reevaluate you every six months or as needed. We can do um, long-term fitness training. I don't like to call it personal training in my business, but fitness yeah. training, because if you're trying to get back into an exercise routine or just don't know what to do at the gym to bump it up, we can do that. The big thing in, I guess, lymphedema is now how far the lymphedema surgeries have come. So I've done a lot of connecting with some of the surgeons in my area mm -hmm. to you know, better prepare my community for surgery and surgical rehab. So mm -hmm. some of that stuff just sort of 
happens naturally as you learn, ooh, I want to try this toy. Ooh, I want to use this modality. Ooh, I have this compression now. Like that mm-hmm. stuff just makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and those are the things that come. With the good, I'm going to follow up with what have been some of the more challenging things when it comes to like, you mentioned you're trying to force things to grow and they're just not there. What are some of those things? Because I know I've definitely had, I have those um those category of challenges in my business right now as well. (laughs) So, I mean, the, the hardest thing about running a business is learning how to run a business. And I think that for me, some of the challenges have been finding great employees and Mm -hmm. it's not that there's not great employees out there, but you know, financially, I can't necessarily compete with the large hospital systems as far Mm -hmm. as salary. Um, I can compete with a lot of the other things and long-term potential and flexibility and benefits, but finding great employees has been more of a challenge than I would have thought. Um, Mm -hmm. Things like establishing the systems I need to use on a day-to-day basis to keep track of, I mean, everything from, Mm -hmm. I had a patient leave and I didn't collect money. And I mean, you Mm -hmm. can't do that when you're running a business. So yeah. Some of the things I've really been focusing on this past year is I hired a business coach who has taught me how to much more effectively run a business. And now I've become so passionate, like I need this business not only to run well and successfully, but to run smoothly, easier for me and easier for my colleagues and employees as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is a perfect example of challenges that you don't necessarily appreciate are happening behind the scenes until you actually start taking on those challenges. So I recently had a situation where um, Texas and winter spring transition is always rough. Okay. If you were, if anybody was at CSM last year in San Antonio, you know, but I was actually here. I practice in a home clinic that I have. And when I was treating my patient, our power went out because again, like who knows what, And so because of that, I didn't have internet. I couldn't collect that payment from the patient. And just because of different schedules not lining up, it took actually like several phone call text exchange to get that money. And when I worked in corporate, that was not my problem. That was not a big of a deal because also I was seeing a crap ton of patients and just the setup of corporate, like it's very, very different. But man, like that one visit and that one like payment that I would have collected that I did not collect, that hurt me. Like I was like looking at my numbers like, oh my God, like we are in potentially in trouble. And it's just wild how much of a difference that is going from a very corporate setting to a more like private practice. So I really resonate with that, Lisa. Yeah, I hired a new employee who's wonderful. And the one insurance that we are in network with is Medicare. And mm-hmm. something happened with her assignment of benefits to Elisa's PT and wellness. So we went, I want to say six to eight weeks without getting paid for a single patient oh that she saw. Oh my God. So, um, yeah, I mean, thankfully we were able to make it all work for everybody, but you know, not having that income as she grew mm-hmm. her caseload, um, was very trying to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to say the least things you don't think about. I'm in a big, beautiful office right now. And you may have heard about all the rain we're having here in California. I um, have a leak in my office. And when you are working with landlords and on different time schedules and they have multiple, you know, offices and buildings, I'm very low on their priority list. However, having patients come in with a wet floor and a leaking window is very high on my priority list. So just learning how to keep your cool. Sometimes it's much harder than others, but if you're not getting paid, if you have a wet floor, these are things that you just do not think about when you want to start a business. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are things that you have to be on top of hundred percent of the time. (laughs) What now that you're three years in, what have been some of those very unforeseen challenges Because I think when we get into business, there's expected challenges. 
I think we have a concept of that. But there's some unexpected ones that just come up because it's Murphy's Law, it's running your own business, etc. What have some of those like unforeseen challenges like leak in your building causing wet floors and whatnot that you have experienced in your business? I mean, you know, we're still dealing with some of the late ramifications of COVID. There are much higher cancellation rates than I think there were prior to COVID. And if okay. someone says, you know, I, I had COVID a week ago, should I come in? The answer is no. So what do you do with your extra time if you're trying to count on that revenue? So managing revenue and forecasting where your money is going to be in a month and in the next year, like that just to me does not come naturally. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge part of my learning curve is how do you budget and how do you forecast and how do you know, okay, I want to grow um, the boutique area in my business and I want to have different garments available but you have to have a variety of sizes available. You have to have mm -hmm. a variety of colors available. Mm -hmm. You have to have a variety of styles because not everybody likes what you like. So yeah. I, I think that financial aspect is really so important to understand. Aside from that, you know, um, there's a car accident on the highway and my therapist can't get to work in time for her first patient. And I have a patient at the same time. How are we going to manage this mm -hmm. right now? Um, my next hire, fingers crossed, is an admin, but I have to look at my phone every time it rings when I'm with a patient. That mm -hmm. has gotten old. My patients yeah. totally understand, you know, I'm a one woman show to a certain extent running the business. Um, I don't like looking at my phone if it rings four times in an hour. Mm -hmm. But if I don't, and it's my employee calling and she's stuck in traffic, there's trouble. If it's school calling yeah. and I have to leave to pick up my daughter, you know, you don't really think about those things because if someone's there for 15, 20 minutes, a good business decision is to say, I'm so sorry, I have to go. I'm not going to charge you for today. But do you mm -hmm. have a plan in place that's going to make it feasible for you to do that? Because yeah. if I give the best and the highest quality customer service, our patients usually understand anyway, but they're going to say, you know what, Lisa, Lisa's running a good business. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt and come back. Mm -hmm. Oasis is doing it right because what do we know about our patients? They don't feel good. They have lymphedema or cancer and they're suffering and they've maybe waited three weeks to get in on my schedule or, oh, please, I'm so swollen and sore today. Can you fit me in? I will do my best to do that. But things happen on both sides, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, that's yeah. been an unexpected challenge. Um, how do you make this all work? How do you do it? Like you said, we all worked, a lot of us worked in a corporate environment where, mm -hmm. you know, okay, your patient canceled, run into the hospital and see if you can see an acute care patient or can you help Sally out down in rehab? You know, it was just told to us or get off the clock and, you know, you eat your lunch a little bit early. You don't have right. that ability when you're running your own business. Yeah. What were some lessons, again, coming from you and I both started in corporate and have now transitioned into private practice, what were some things you had to unlearn or maybe learn differently going from corporate, again, to private practice? I am someone who tends to take things personally. And that is just unacceptable in business. If someone cancels, that is not personal. If mm -hmm. someone doesn't accept a job offer, that is not personal. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't like the way I want to run my business and they decide to leave or do something else or say that's not the way I do it, sometimes there's flexibility, but sometimes there's not. This is my mm -hmm. business. This is how I run things here. Mm -hmm. um, and going on the defensive used to be my go-to. Well, well, why not? And what have I done wrong? And what can I do better? And, you know, I'm learning all those things, of course, as well, because sometimes mm -hmm. I do make mistakes. I'm only human. But um, when you leave the corporate environment, you have to figure out how to deal with all of those little things, plus the angry patients, plus the sick patients, um, you know, plus 
all the business things that we never learned or how to deal with, or we never had to collect money. Do you enforce cancellation fees? I mean, mm-hmm. you kind of have to. Yeah. I didn't ever think about that. Um, so you have to unlearn all of those things that you just thought, well, someone else can deal with, or I guess actually learn is better than unlearn. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's been quite eye opening. And sometimes I'm like, Take a deep breath before you make this phone call, Lisa. You don't want to <laughs> upset anyone or get upset yourself. Um, yeah. But we are still human. And I mean, a really good example. This is terribly sad. I've been working with a very, very ill patient. And she didn't show up for her appointment last week. And um, I sent an email. I called her phone number. No response. Finally, I sent a text message. And I just got an message a text message back from this patient's family member saying unfortunately she's not doing very well she's been put on hospice and not expected to make it and my first response is tears right we get attached to our patients we're the ones who sit with them for an hour every week and get close to them but you also have to realize like the business side okay i've got four patient of spots available now and you have to see it from both sides of the business mm-hmm. and the personal we're good at what we do because we love it and we love our patients but we also have to be good at running the business and yeah you got to step away you got to figure out how to do both mhm that is so and it's so powerful and so applicable, especially in oncology. Like I think we definitely are as a, like as a breed, as a whole, we're very caring individuals. We're very giving individuals. And sometimes it's, it's like, you have to reconcile. There is a business side of things. You know, I think one thing that I, and I can't remember who said it, but really explained it as far as like, it's not personal, it's business, but like it's business because at the end of the day, you know, you're running a practice where you now you're obviously paying yourself, hopefully at this point, which I know because you said so, but like in business, you should pay yourself. You're also responsible for other people's paychecks. Now, like you have to be able to sustain the business from that side so that you can continue being a business. And I think that's sometimes hard to learn. It's really hard. And um, I've working with my coach and my coaching program this last year, which is full of some really incredible female entrepreneurs, like you don't always get it right the first time. And you might make a business decision and a month later say, you know what, I don't like that decision, but that's on me. And that's Mm -hmm. the way I decided to attempt it. And you're right, I'm, I'm responsible for other people's paychecks. And I really wish I could make this work, but I can't. So I'm going to make it work this way now. The, the flexibility, we, we have to roll with the changes. And that's kind of one of the mantras here at Oasis is, you know, I'm doing my best to make it work for everybody. And that includes changing things when I don't like it. And if you don't like it, tell me. Yeah. And if I can make it better for everybody, I will. But it is, it is truly a business. And mm-hmm. it is truly... Um, an all consuming thing to run a business aside from the commitment we give to our patients and to ourselves and our family, right? Um, Mm -hmm. My sanity some days is very minimal. (laughs) And um, that's because I haven't done anything to perform any self care for myself. Some Mm -hmm. weeks go by and I say I have not practiced what I've preached at all. I haven't done any mindful meditation, any diaphragm breathing, any moving outside of my, you know, lovely new office chair, but Mm -hmm. you got to take care of yourself and your business as much as you take care of your patients. Hmm. Yes. Yes. How, I actually want to ask a little different question. One of the things that I've been exposed to through following various teachings, various other kind of creators and business owners here on the great wide web is the importance of seeking out help from other people. And sometimes that looks like mentorship. Sometimes that looks like me actually paying someone to help me with a particular problem. And I'd love to know your thoughts on this, Lisa. I think that is something that is a little foreign in the physical therapy rehab world. Um, I think this stems from a lot of things 
um, that we frankly don't even have time to unpack on the podcast today. But I think there is sometimes a lot of resistance to therapists getting that kind of help, especially paying for it. You are paying for a business coach to help you with this. Can we talk about that? Yeah, I, and I think I was resistant at first to pay for help. Um, and when you pay for good help, it's you have to budget for it because it is an expense. But um, speaking of the great wide web, I think there's so much incredible information out there and there are mm-hmm. so many incredible groups. But what I've learned is not all the information you get in the groups is right. And most of the time, it's hard to distinguish what's good information and what's bad information. Mm -hmm. And some of the early mistakes, some were, you know, very little and minimal, but you have to redo something and our time is valuable and nobody wants to be doing this at nine, 10 o'clock at night. So to finally find the right person. And I feel like the groups have been great at connecting me to some of these incredible um, people who have helped me, who I've paid them for their expertise Mm -hmm. is, you know, as simple as finding a very specific um, contract for an employee in the healthcare world. Like you can go and Google, help me find an employment contract, but it has nothing to do with what we're doing. And Mm -hmm. it's not the right verbiage that we want to use. Um, you know, this was a simple no brainer thing for me because hopefully I'm going to continue to hire and then you hire someone and they leave and it doesn't, you're going to need this again and again. You better make sure you're using the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, about, I would say I'm coming up upon the year end of my one year mentorship with my current group. And I would say probably about six months before that, maybe a little longer, I started doing research on finding a mentor. And Mm -hmm. I really wanted to focus on someone in the healthcare world who had that experience. And I did some interviewing and I found someone who was excellent, but just not the right match for me. And Mm -hmm. I think this is um, one of the things that you don't know until you try, you know, was that an expensive mistake? Perhaps, but I learned about certain things that I know I can't run my business that way. And I can't possibly talk to my patients that way. And that's certainly not going to work for me. And I know it works for a lot of people because that coach had a very successful, you know, resume of clients that they had worked with. Mm -hmm. And I think that investing a certain amount of money in finding the right person. um, And then when I found my current coach, I was like, oof, um, am I ready for this? But when you sit down and break it down, and she was very incredible at saying, okay, so this is your investment, but here's what I think you're going to get out of it. It -hmm. just, it makes sense. And like I said, at the end of one year, I feel I'm at a completely different level business-wise. I question Mm -hmm. myself a lot less. And just because my mentorship is ending doesn't mean my relationship with this coach is ending. I hope it's not. Please tell me it's not, but you know, um, you just, you meet certain people who are at slightly different times in their business ownership, dealing with the Mm -hmm. same things that we're dealing with and the same questions. And how do I do this? You know, um, Mm -hmm. you can try and try and try. And sometimes someone will be lucky enough to get it right the first time. But for me, it just made sense to make the investment in myself and in my business. And I think I'm a better boss today than I was when I hired my first employee almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm working fewer hours at night, which is appreciated by my family. Um, You know, so all these little things that you don't think about when you're starting a business and working 12, 14 hour days, you, you appreciate so much more when you've hired the right people to help you. Mm -hmm. That is one thing I finally I kind of had a similar experience with my virtual assistants. Um, So I was working with one previously, actually almost two years ago, I think it was. And like, it was good, but I didn't realize that it was just good and not great until I started working with my current team. And for me, 
the time that I have bought back with the money I, I paid them to do various services for me, the time that I have bought back for myself, and I really appreciate you talking about the sanity because I feel like I'm always insane. And I feel just like an overall more, more well-balanced human being because I'm not worried about all these little things. And I mean, when you talked about finding a contract, Lisa, I had like a visceral response because I remember spending literally hours when I first started my private practice trying to find like verbiage for different patient agreements and whatever, like it was killing me. And I just, I'm not a lawyer. I don't need to spend my time doing that. So I just, oh, I really felt that when you were talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've spent a lot of time and hours looking at things that someone else can give us for $20. Right. You know? And then you think about, okay, well, I've done this. I'm investing time here. So if someone else can do this, that buys me a one hour patient. What I'm making for a one hour patient can pay for that three times. Sometimes. Yeah. Not always, but how is, right. how is one going to affect the other? And, you know, a year in, six months in, maybe two or five years in, I'll continue to come back and say, boy, I'm so glad I did this because, mm -hmm. you know, now I can afford such and such because I planned it out prior. Mm -hmm. What are some of the lessons you have learned and been able to implement since working with this coach? Um, you know, I think planning is probably one of the biggest things I've learned to do. Um, and she would probably tell you, I'm still not the best at writing it down and getting it to her on time, but you know, we all have our own methods. I, I know what I want to do this week, this month, this quarter. I know what I would like my goal to be by the end of the year. And I think now I've realized, okay, you know, I'm better because I have an excellent employee who only wants to give me two days or who only can give me two days versus really fighting for that full-time employee. Mm -hmm. I know that if I want to expand again or get a different piece of equipment that trying to do it this month where I might go in the hole and be tighter on my own paycheck isn't worth it because the patients are still going to be coming in in six months. So it's, it is that, that planning factor. And I think that goes along with understanding the financials very, very significantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I create um, something that's going to be appealing for the masses? How do I create something that's going to be appealing for myself and my employees? How do I create something that's going to be appealing for my customers right here in San Ramon, California, and my customers who may want to buy my course or courses across the country, right? Mm -hmm. So um, figuring that out, so the, the time management, the planning, and the, the budgeting, because I mean, I just, I knew nothing about the financial aspect of my business and mm -hmm. I knew I knew nothing and I knew I was going to be in trouble because when your business starts doing well um, and you don't know how to manage that money, it's scary. It's yeah. really scary to not know how to manage that money. <laughs> yeah. And I, Lisa, I really appreciate you sharing that because that's something I think we envision like as business owners, like we're going to make a lot, like we're going to help a lot of people and we're going to get paid a lot of money in the process because we are doing a valuable exchange of goods and services. But that fear and apprehension and uncertainty that comes with like, now I'm making money. Like there's so much unknown associated with that, which I think as a new business owner was really foreign to me. But now that I've been in the game a little bit, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Like what do I even do in that circumstance, right? Completely, completely. And I mean, and it's a little different when I first started and, you know, we were still in the days of COVID and I was driving around doing all mobile visits. Mm -hmm. What were my expenses mm -hmm. then? My expenses were my, you know, my iPad, my EMR. Um, even then I knew I needed help with billing and my gas, you know, mm -hmm. but as you grow, it's, 
the rent for the office. It's all of the equipment and all of the wholesale items. And it's not just the salary, but it's the taxes on the salary and the paycheck company that I'm using to pay their salary mm -hmm. and the workers comp here in California and all the other little things that you're like, Ooh, hmm. and she's super awesome and has all this experience and was paid really well at her last employer. How am I going to compete with that? You know? Yeah. So you like, you just, you learn as you go. And the mm -hmm. better you do, the more I've invested in the help and the systems and the services to make myself more efficient, because I still have visions of where I want Oasis to go that have changed. And, yeah. you know, I thought maybe it would be just me and I'd be able to do everything. And let me tell you, world, you cannot do everything. Yeah. Try as you might. You cannot. And if you can, tell me what your secret is, because I haven't figured it out. I'm, I'm actually going to offer a slightly different perspective, Lisa. I think if you're doing everything by yourself, you're not thinking big enough on what your impact could be for the community. That's, That's my thought. Yes. I think you're playing safe if you're doing it by yourself. <laughs> there you go. I love that. Totally right. You're totally right. Because what we can do, um, what this, you know, environment and what this specialty has to offer is growing by leaps and bounds and there is so much we can do to help our patients and we want to do it all and we should do it all we should that's what's going to set us apart from the competition and the big hospital system that might have four therapists but they can't do the long-term stuff they can't do the garments so you're referring here 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 and here um mm -hmm. yeah we, we can do it all so i'm really glad you bring that up because that kind of ties into my next question as far as how this is like a two-prong question how are you competing with the other clinics, other institutions in your area from a patient perspective? Like, how are you setting yourself apart to provide optimal patient care? But then also, how are you competing when it comes to an employment, a place of employment? When it comes to patient care, um, I know a lot of the therapists in the area. I think they're all great, but I also know what the hospital systems can offer. And that is your um, 20 visits, or that is exactly what Medicare says, or we're on a wait list, so we got to get you out. I can offer the continuum. I can offer yeah. you the care you need for the rest of your life, for the rest of mm -hmm. your treatment. Um, I've invested in some pretty cool technology. I've invested in amazing therapists. I have invested in creating a beautiful environment. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're going to get the best care here. Not to say the other therapists aren't fantastic, but the care and the follow-up and the follow-through. I don't think anyone mm. can compete with that yet. I really don't. Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to do with my therapists is make sure that they have what they want. And mm -hmm. for one of my therapists, she loves the cancer continuum and she has specialties in, you know, dizziness and balance, which is something we see a lot from, you know, CIPN and um, other side effects from the medication. But I never thought I would be treating vertigo in my clinic, BPPV, mm -hmm. and she loves it. So if she can see those patients as well, and then mm -hmm. they say, oh, your primary focus is cancer. I actually know my friend, you know, Mrs. Jones needs that therapy and this is a nice space and this is a great location, you know? So I think that giving my therapist what they want to stay happy and, mm -hmm. you know, the flexibility that I wish I had sometimes. And, you know, right now all of my employees are scheduled part-time or per diem, whatever you want to call that. Okay. Um, so they have the flexibility to say, Lisa, I'm going to be out next month. Okay. Let's see how we can make, you know, it work with your patients getting seen or not going a week or two without being seen. Um, so we all have to work together in the clinic to make sure that your patients stay happy and cared for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still working out now, you know, can I assist with continuing education? And when you have part-time employees, that's not something that really big institutions have ever reimbursed. Um, mm -hmm. And at this point in time, I haven't, but I'm trying to figure out how I can. 
If yeah. it benefits Oasis PT and wellness, let's make it work. Why not? That's so cool. I think, you know, finding the right clinicians with the right skill and passion, but giving them what they want. I only mm-hmm. want to work four hours a week. Well, patients usually need to be seen more than once a week, but that's okay. We'll make it work mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. Right? I really appreciate when you were talking about how are you competing from a like a care offering perspective, which I don't know this I don't know the specifics, but you are not trying to undercut those companies on cost. Like they as big institutions can sometimes afford to go low. Mm-hmm. But when we're running small businesses, we can't necessarily afford to do that if we're going to pay our therapist well and keep the lights on and also take home pay for ourselves at the end of the day. But what you're competing on is the quality of care that you are providing for those patients. And I think that is something that I have identified in my area is really lacking. Like there are some institutions, some very large institutions in my area that do treat cancer and do offer cancer rehab, but the patients aren't seen consistently. The patients aren't seen for three plus months because we have an enormous lymphedema treatment wait list in the area at these major institutions. So like we, and I don't think we should try to undercut the competition financially. Like we're, it's not feasible and we're not going to survive, but what we can offer is a quality experience that I know they're not getting in other places. Cause I've seen it. <laughs> Absolutely. We've all seen it. We all know it's happening. I mean, just think about, you know, the last time you had to go to a specialist or, you know, have a test done. You walk in, they barely say hello. They say, okay, your your copay is $60. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's my $60. I literally sat in front of the doctor for 10 minutes, didn't get the answers that I was satisfied with and told to go on my way. I mean, so when you think about something like that, I didn't think about the $60, although I did that night when I was like, ah, I could have had sushi if I didn't go to that doctor's right? Right? <laughs> But, um, you know, you, you drop a copay like that down, not even thinking twice about it. Um, mm-hmm. And you expect a caring physician, a, a, you expect good care. We all expect mm-hmm. good care and we don't always get that. Um, you know, one of my patients came the other day for a compression bra and said, you know, I know they're selling this at the vendor down the street, but I'm, I really, I'm happy to give you my business. I'd rather give it to you because I didn't have the size. I said, I'm happy to order it for you. Perfect. Because my patients know they can trust to get the best service from me. And, you know, I'm not perfect. If I don't write myself a reminder, it might not get ordered that day, but let mm-hmm. me right here, order it for you and I'll have it next week. They're happy right. to help me and my business because I've given them great care in the past. Mm-hmm. I think that it's it's really a particular example that I draw on my on my own experience. Actually, when I was working corporate, so it was like my first week on the job, and I was looking to order compression bandaging supplies for my patients with lymphedema. And so the company I was working for had a contract with a particular supplier, and they ordered, I ordered a really big shipment. Like it was a lot of money that I was dropping on this, even though it wasn't my money, it was still like company money. And they got it all wrong. I mean, like Mm. wrong size, wrong product altogether. And I was so turned off in that moment of like, you can't even get this right. I don't want you to be messing up my patient's orders down the road. And so I immediately pivoted and went to my local DME, who is also a small business. And I said, this is my problem. This is what I'm looking to solve. And they have gone above and beyond ever since then. I've been working with them for almost, oh my God, almost five years now. And I mean, it really goes like they cannot compete with this large company on cost, but they can on customer service. And when working with me and making sure that my patients are getting what they need. And I think that is what we really have to offer as small businesses. Like I can't, you know, I can't compete with big ones. I can give you a really spectacular experience though. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I feel the same way. I have a local fitter and you know, she's a one woman show and sometimes it takes three weeks and I do offer garments now. I offer ready to Mm -hmm. win, but for anyone who needs custom, I don't have the time or patience to do that. And I send everyone to her because she gets it right all the time. 
and she's mm -hmm. fantastic. And she's still got a three week wait list. So it's not like she's hurting because she's the best in the area and everyone sends to her. Mm -hmm. So exactly. And creating these relationships, I think is great for your business because I don't think she sees me as a threat. She sees me as a really good therapist who wants the patients to have the best. So if a patient yeah. finds her first and says, you happen to know a therapist, my doctor just sent me for a sleeve. She's going to refer back to me as well. Yeah. And absolutely. that is key. Um, I've never talked bad about any of the therapists or programs that are around here because they know sometimes they have to discharge a patient and the patient might need more and I might be able to offer that service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really important. That's awesome. You have shared a lot of information that has been hard fought, hard won over the past three years of running your own practice. And I think that's a lot of insight more than what the therapist who probably is just starting is like, I know I need help. I don't even know where to turn. And there's free resources out there, right? You've talked about it. You have even shared some of the places you found them. But there's a time and a place for free resources. There's a time and a place for paid help from an expert or even someone who is just 10 steps down the road from you which is exactly what you've done with this new course that you have come out with. Can we talk about that? We can, we can, yeah. So I think that as we've been discussing, we are always committing ourselves to the best patient care. And it's easy to find the class you wanna take and the course you wanna take. When it comes to yes. business, I found it very hard to get everything I wanted in one place. So what I have done is created a an online course that is a checklist. It is a resource list. It is a what's worked for me list with some real world examples of what you can expect to make, what you can expect to bill, coding, all those little things that take up a lot of time when you're starting up for mm -hmm. those of us who want to succeed because there really are not that many resources for us as very specialty healthcare practitioners in the oncology and lymphedema world to start our own business. Um, and most clinicians like you and I have not had, a, I had no education on how to start and how to create a business. Mm -hmm. One of the things that actually caught my attention as an aside in one of these Facebook groups was someone that said, it was a new graduate and they said, I was specifically told that healthcare is not a business. And I did not respond to that Facebook post, but I had steam coming out of my ears because I am in fact creating a healthcare business. Yep. I pride myself on the customer service I give, but I am also at that point three years in where I pride myself on the business that I am running. And no business owner is going to not ever make a mistake. It is not realistic. It is not practical. Um, how big the mistakes are will depend on how much time and perhaps money you invest in learning. Mm -hmm. But this is, I think, a really basic course that will give practitioners the information they need on how to start a business. How do you file for a name? How do you register your business? I needed a license for my city, for my state. Like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, you don't think about it. It's not just picking up and making a business card and going out and collecting patients. Mm -hmm. So um, I've tried to make it accessible. I have some, you know, even big vision down the line with a course like this people like you and I and some of the other really successful private practices. I want to create some sort of think tank or mastermind where we can all help each other because we're not competing with each other. Even if you were down the road, there's enough business for all of us to be really, really successful. And we could all use the help. We could. So I feel like this was a good time for me as I was going through it and working with this coach and organizing and writing down, what do I need? I'm sure I'm not the only one who needs this. So I've created this resource for other therapists and um, I'm hoping that it'll be really helpful for other therapists as they're getting started down the road of private practice. 
to highlight just a, like a numbers perspective of what Lisa is talking about, we're expecting 2 million people to be diagnosed with cancer in the United States in 2023. I saw a statistic this weekend that 18 million cancer survivors are expected to live, like I, if I'm remembering the stat correctly, so don't quote me on this, like 18 million people are alive five years after their cancer diagnosis, like right now in the U.S. There is no lack of patients, even in your area, dear listener, wherever you're listening to this from right now, there is no lack of patients and those patients need you because I can guarantee you if you are anything like Fort Worth, there is not enough people, not enough practitioners who are treating patients right now and patients are going without and that is the biggest disservice that we can do to our patients. So I am so excited for this course, Lisa. It is so needed. I remember countless nights when I first started my private practice of like, what the heck am I doing? I don't understand this. I don't know where to go. I thankfully had my husband to guide me through some of it because his private practice is a couple years older than mine. But I mean, still like he's orthopedic athletic and his patient population is totally different from mine. And so I really appreciate that you have this very unique oncology and lymphedema perspective from which you're approaching this information. And I'm so, so excited about this course. What is it called? <laughs> Thank you. It is how to start your own private practice in lymphedema and oncology rehab. Um, fairly self-explanatory. Um, I really just wanted to make it available and accessible. And um, I'm thrilled to offer the Onco PT community a 20, 25% discount. Let's go 25. Let's go oh big time for you, Elise. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll create a special code just for the Onco PT community. And, um, you know, I, I think that we'll all do better when we work together and when we help each other out. And I, I don't want something astronomical. I do think that you know, putting this all together is going to be more beneficial for a lot of people, make it easier for a lot of people. But I mm -hmm. think we have to start looking at these things and make them available because yep. we're not competing. We're all out to help each other. Agreed. Agreed. And ultimately, when we compete, it's the patients who suffer. Um, I I feel like sometimes in a very weird way, I'm curious if you have this perspective, cancer rehab in a very strange and unnecessary way can be sometimes very cutthroat competition. Um, and I find that that is more among bigger institutions. I don't see that with the small clinics because I think everybody has, or at least most people I encounter have a really good idea of like, when my patient gets helped, everyone benefits, um, no matter who they see. So I'm curious if you have seen that in your own experience in cancer and lymphedema rehab. Uh, to a, to a small extent, I okay. have seen that because everybody wants to keep their patients within their system. I think yep. that's just the way that business runs. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm, I think the benefit of all of us as private practitioners is I'm not trying to take away from the large cancer institutions. I'm trying to work with them right? Because there are people right here in my community that don't want to deal with the San Francisco Bay Area traffic and drive an hour to their hospital for PT, which is something they're going to have to do perhaps multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I am happy to call all the doctors, all the therapists at the other facilities. How can I help you? What do you want? I don't always treat exactly the same way. I don't always mm -hmm. believe exactly the same mentality that they have but I'm going to help them get their patients better to make their results look even better. So mm -hmm. yes, I think that competition is out there to that extent, but I think we need to, again, and this kind of goes where it's like, don't take it personally. It's not me. It's not me. Yeah. It's all about patients. So how do we work yeah. to just benefit the patient? Um, Absolutely. And on that note, one of the other things I've done is created the strength after breast cancer program for patients and created that as an online course because there are a lot of patients who don't have access to physical therapy. They don't have mm -hmm. access to the best knowledge and the best care. And anyone who's been through a breast cancer diagnosis, we know now they need to exercise. They need to learn how to do it safely and effectively. Um, mm -hmm. And when this course is led by physical therapists who are going to show 
very common modifications and very common um, questions, we know that we're at least doing something for the community beyond what we can reach mm -hmm. in our clinic walls to help them get back to exercising. Yeah. And I always tell my patients, I don't care what your long-term goal is. If you want to just be able to go for a walk, if you want to get on the floor with the kids or grandkids, or if you want to throw a big fat tire in a CrossFit class, you can do it all, but there are rules. And here is how the rules have been laid out. And if you mm -hmm. follow these rules, you can go back to that, you know, awesome throwing a tire around CrossFit class. It might take you a while to get there, mm -hmm. but don't lose sight of that. I had a young woman who came in a few weeks ago with breast cancer, early stage lymphedema. I want to mountain climb. And my last therapist told me I'm never going to be able to do that. I said, why? Let's follow the rules. You can absolutely do that. You know, I wouldn't recommend starting with, you know, El Capitan here in Yosemite as your first venture back into rock climbing. But sure you can. Let's talk about how we're going to get you there. And all of a sudden, like I saw... I don't know if it was a wave of relief or just, I can, you know, of course you can. Let's figure it out and let's talk through the steps mm -hmm. because that's what they want to do. Let's get them there. Mm -hmm. um, this class has all of the basics that a patient, any patient needs to get started. And then the rules of how to progress as you move forward. Mm -hmm. There are always going to be patients who need more handholding um, and an online class won't be appropriate for them. But for people who understand the concepts of, exercise and body awareness it's a great option for them that is so cool and this is absolutely where we should be headed as far as what are innovative ways that we can increase accessibility for our patients to get this very needed information that's something i'm exploring in my own private practice so it's really cool to see you doing that in yours already so i'm so so excited about that one last time what is the name of the course? And then where can people find information about your private practice course? My private practice course is available on my website, um, as is my Strength After Breast Cancer online virtual course. Mm -hmm. Additionally, you can find the links on my Instagram page, and I'll make sure you have um, all of that information to post, okay. to post uh, down below. But um yeah, they're, they're available just through my website right now, through my social media outlets, and um, I'm, I'm making them available for your, for your viewers. Yay. Oh my God. I'm so <laughs> excited. Lisa, congrats on three years of your private practice. It is so cool to get to see how this has all grown over the past few years the changes that have been made, the just like personal and professional growth that you've shared with me over this journey. I'm really, really thrilled to be kind of inside on that information. So thank you so much for that. Where can people find and follow you on social media? Oasis PT and wellness uh, separated by underscores on Instagram, Oasis Physical Therapy and Wellness on Facebook. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's a LinkedIn page too, all under the same name. Lisa Silvestri is, you know, my personal account, and you can find me there as well. But um, happy to connect with everybody. I think that's what we all need is more connection and right. more help. I will, of course, link to all of this in the show notes. But again, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. This was so fun. I'm so thrilled to see how your practice continues to grow and just all the good that you know, I know you're doing in your community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I love chatting with you, Elise.